In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation, and it's great to be with all of you on this uh, first Friday in the season of Lent. So, uh, as always, we'd like to start off our conversation by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary is the Mother of God, Mary is the mother of the church, and Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. When we pray the Hail Holy Queen, we also invoke Mary as our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So we would like to uh, invite Mary to be with us, to inspire us by her presence, and to enlighten us through the power of her prayers. We say the prayer that Mary loves most, and that prayer, of course, is the angelic salutation that we call the Hail Mary. Together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now we'd like to invite to be with us our spiritual director. Our spiritual director is the is the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit has um many titles. The Holy Spirit is the paraclete. Holy Spirit is also known as the gift of gifts. Holy Spirit is also known as the sweet guest of the soul. Holy Spirit is also known as our consoler. Our consoler, but also he's known as our counselor. Holy Spirit is also known as our interior master or teacher. Our interior master or teacher. St. Paul says we really don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba. Abba, Father or Daddy. So let's ask the Holy Spirit to be with us as our spiritual guide as well as to pour within our intellect the divine rays of his light as well as to set our hearts on fire with love for God and for the salvation of souls. As we pray the traditional prayer to the Holy Spirit And that is, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful, by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now 
and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady of Guadalupe, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Ignatius, St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. St. Maria Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, my friends, I give you more encouragement. I promise to pray for you in the Holy Spirit sacrifice of the Mass. In the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. There's no greater prayer in the world than the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. It's the prayer par excellence. The prayer par excellence the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. So I'd like to place you on the altar and beg for the following graces. As we initiate this holy season of Lent, I'd like to pray that we would all be open to the inspirations of the Holy Spirit. That we be docile to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit because our sanctification depends in large part upon being open and docile to the Holy Spirit. And this could be a prayer that we could say during the course of the day. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. My second intention will be to pray for our families that this season of Lent that they would return to God with all their hearts. That they'll be able to live out Luke chapter 15, which is the lost and found chapter. The lost coin, the coin that's found. The lost sheep, the sheep that is found. The lost son, the prodigal son that comes back and returns to the loving embrace of his father. My last intention will be I'd like to pray in a special way for The conversion of sinners, especially like to pray for deathbed sinners. That is to say, those who, those who will be dying within the next 24 hours, that they would open up their hearts to God's infinite mercy and be saved. As we read in the gospel yesterday, Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world, but he lose his soul in the process? What can we change for our mortal soul? So let's form the habit, my friends, of praying often for 
the conversion of sinners, but especially deathbed sinners. So, my friends, brief catechetical instruction I'd like to give today is the following. It's basically a reminder for all of us of this holy season that we're in. And going back to Ash Wednesday, which will receive their ashes, many of us. The ashes are symbolic of our mortality that one day we're going to die. We don't know the day, nor the hour, nor the moment, nor the, the manner, but to not be negligent and always trying to focus on how we can live holy lives, have a holy death and be saved. The ashes is also symbolic of repent and believe the gospel. We're all called to repentance. We're all called to a life of conversion. Then our Lord gives us, our Lord gives us the three classical traditional ways of living out Lent. And by implementing these three practices, we can arrive at this conversion. There is what is called a radical conversion of life, but also there is what is called a daily conversion. A radical conversion of life, but also a, a daily conversion. And our Lord, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6, points to three ways. The tri-dimensional way to arrive at this real conversion of heart. And it's to go up, to go in, and to go out. That's right, to go up, to go in, and to go out. To go up through prayer, go in through penance, go out through the practice of almsgiving. So that's a summary of, of Ash Wednesday, the meaning of ashes, as well as the call to a life of conversion. That conversion can be activated by means of those three traditional practices, by a fervent prayer life, a... Um, sincere desire to do penance and a an active life of chari charity or almsgiving to others. So I'd like to start giving you a summary of the first reading of Isaiah and the Gospel today by means of a personal anecdote. On one occasion I was taking a walk in the park on a nice sunny day. And as I was walking in the park along the footpath, I noticed in front of me there was a, a black bird, a crow. And I expected, as always, that the as I got close to the blackbird, the crow, that the crow would fly away, take flight. 
But to my surprise, this never happened. I got closer and closer and the, do the, the bird didn't take off. I thought maybe I've got some Franciscan charism within me. A latent gift manifesting itself in my latter years. But it wasn't because I had this Franciscan charisma, but rather but because the crow had a broken wing. And then the other crows started to send almost upon me, trying to defend the crow. And then I flew away. But it made me think. It made me reflect. I was able to derive fruit from this and turn this into a meditation, an examination of conscience also. And this was my conclusion. We are we are like that that crow. We are called like all birds to fly high in the spiritual life, to soar, to reach the heights, to perch on the summit of the mountain. We're called to do that. But we must have two wings. If we only have one wing, we're never going to get off the ground. What are those two wings? They are the wings, the wings of prayer and the wings of penance. Those two P's. The wings of prayer and the wings of penance. We can't give wind in our sails so that we can sail and cross the sea of life. We can fly high and perch ourselves on the summit of the highest mountain. That's right. So you're going to see and read during the course of these 40 days constant references to prayer and penance as well as almsgiving. Isaiah today speaks about different ways in which we can practice penance. And he says to set free the oppressed to break every yoke, share your bread with the hungry, shelter the oppressed and the homeless, clothing the naked when you see them, not turn your back on them. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn and your wounds shall quickly be healed. So what Isaiah is doing, he's connecting fasting with almsgiving. He's making a, an intimate connection between fasting and almsgiving. And if you like, the corporal works of mercy. I was hungry and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was a foreigner and homeless and you welcomed me. I was sick and in prison, and you came to visit me. When? Whenever we do it to the least of our brothers and sisters, then we do it to Christ. So that's Isaiah chapter 58, 1 to 9, making a connection between fasting and charity or almsgiving. And we have the the responsorial psalm 
is perhaps one of the greatest acts of contrition you have in the Bible. Now, I'd like to give you the context of this, the psalm, the responsorial psalm. And it wouldn't be a bad idea if we pray this psalm today. It wouldn't be a bad idea that we pray this psalm even before we go to confession. So the context of this psalm is the following. King David, he shirks his responsibility to go out into the battlefield with Joab, the general, and the Israelites to fight against their enemies. But he stays in Jerusalem. He takes a long siesta. He wanders on the rooftop. His eyes wander to see the beautiful woman bathing, Bathsheba. He has relations with her. She conceives a child. He tries to get the husband of the woman to go and sleep with the, with the wife. He fails to do it. And then what David does is he puts, he puts this man, the husband of Bathsheba, in the front where the battle was most fierce, and he is mowed down and killed. So David commits adultery, then he murders one of his soldiers. And God sends Nathan the prophet to wake up the conscience of David giving David the parable of a rich man who took the ewe lamb of a poor man, and David says, that man deserves death. And Nathan the prophet says, that man is you, David. You have stolen the innocent. You've killed the innocent. And finally, David's conscience that he's been suppressing is opened. His conscience has been enlightened by the Holy Spirit by means of the prophet Nathan, Nathan and that parable. And then from that, we have the psalm that the church gives us today to pray over. So I've given you the context. This is called Psalm 51, sometimes known in Latin as the as the miserere. Miserere, which means mercy, have mercy in me. So this is a great psalm that can be utilized as a penitential act and even as a even as a as a preparation for the sacrament of confession. Okay? So I've actually posted that for you. Psalm 51. If you pray the liturgy, the hours also, morning prayer, we have also this Psalm 51 known as the Miserere. Have mercy on me, O God, in your goodness, in the greatness of your compassion. Wipe out my offense. Thoroughly wash me from my guilt and of my sin cleanse me. For I acknowledge my offense, and my sin is before me always. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. I really like that part. He says, against you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. That's a good verse because... We live in a society where, like David, we tend to suppress our conscience. And I like to call this the blame game. I like to call this the, the blame game. I think we can be responsible for what's called the blame game. And you can see it at the very beginning of the Bible. 
Adam and Eve commit original sin. And God goes down to talk with Adam and Eve. And he asks Adam what has happened. And Adam says, yes, he ate from the fruit, but the woman that you put in the garden, she gave the fruit to me. And then the woman blamed the serpent. I like to call this the blame game. The blame game. How often, how often do we play the blame game? That before, after we do something, instead of humbly admitting our fault, accepting that we failed, assuming the responsibility of our actions, we try to blame the society. We blame maybe the church. We blame maybe our parents. We blame maybe the social milieu. We blame so many different things, but we don't often have the courage to humbly admit that it's our fault. That's why what David says, he says, against you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Then he says, my sacrifice, O God, is a contrite spirit. A heart contrite and humbled, O God, you will not spurn. Contrite heart. That's what we're called to do in this season of Lent, to have a contrite spirit and a humble heart. Later on in the psalm, we have the words, Lord, send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth which is part of the classical prayer to the Holy Spirit. So there we have the response or real psalm. The gospel today is the following. Jesus is approached by the disciples of John the Baptist. And just that you're aware that John the Baptist, John the Baptist was also forming the future apostles of Christ. And you, if you watch the the movie of The Chosen by Jonathan Rumi, you see Andrew and John being with John the Baptist. So some of the first apostles were actually formed by John the Baptist before. And then Jesus is walking and John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. And they get up, they follow Christ, he turns around and says, what are you looking for? Rabbi, where do you live? He says, come and see. And they spent the whole afternoon with Christ. So some of the those who are still disciples of John the Baptist, and John the Baptist trained his disciples in deep prayer as well as in penance and mortification and fasting. And the question is, why do we and the Pharisees fast much, but, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus responds by saying, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them. Then Jesus says the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast. This goes back to what we what we heard last week in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. 
There's a time for everything. There's a time to be born. There's a time to die. There's a time to plant. There's a time to uproot. There's a time to laugh. There's a time to weep. There's a time for peace. There's a time for war. There's a time to embrace in a time not to embrace. There's a time for everything underneath the sun. There's a time for everything. So, let's then talk about this reality of, of fasting or practicing penance. It is indispensable in our lives. We have to practice penance. We have to practice fasting in one way or another. So much so that our Lord said, our Lord said, unless you do penance, you will all perish. Jesus also said that some devils some devils are cast out only by prayer and by fasting. We had the gospel shortly before Ash Wednesday where the apostles are there at the foot of the mountain. Jesus is that, has come down from the transfiguration and the apostles are trying to cast out a demon. And they couldn't. And our Lord cast out the demon. They said, why couldn't we do it? Jesus said, this one comes out only through prayer. That's Mark. And Matthew says through prayer and fasting. So, what I'd like to do, I've, I have quite a bit of material on this topic. Quite a bit of material on this topic, and I'd like to... I'd like to say this, with respect to the practice of penance and mortification and self-denial and fasting, I would encourage all of you to, to consult your spiritual director, your spiritual guide, your spiritual director, your spiritual guide, your confessor on this topic. I think it's better for us to do it with proper spiritual direction, proper guidance, proper direction, and under obedience then to undertake it without certain um, orientation because it's not always easy to know exactly what forms of penance that we should undertake. It's not always easy. And it could, it could sometimes happen that the devil can tempt us to go to extremes and... Um, and to do uh, do damage. I mean, that can happen. Possibly not that much. For example, the life of Dominic Savio did too much, and John ba John Bosco had to had to reel him in and and hold him back because he was so fervent in doing penance that he was damaging his health. Even the Lady of Fatima said to the children of Fatima not to wear the rope around their waists at night. So they could rest. So I suggest that this be done. Done with proper spiritual direction, and by obedience to your to your director. So 
So what I'd like to do is uh, I'd like to just go through various ways. The way I've written out my talk is I've got fasting in the Old Testament, fasting in the New Testament, the fasting of Paul, that of Christ. Then they have different ways that we can practice fasting different ways with respect to eating we can do it and then i i've written down various reasons to motivate us just like this i'd like to start off by the example of a saint and then i like to go through various ways that we can do this okay in the 1800s, in France, at the end of the French Revolution, which devastated much of France, morally and spiritually, there was a priest that was sent to an out-of-the-way parish to convert the parish. And the name of the place was Arras. And the name of the priest was John Vianney. We call him the Curie of Arras. He arrives and he can't seem to find the church and he sees a boy and says, you tell me, what, tell me the way to Arras and I'll tell you the way to heaven. So he arrives and basically everything is is in disarray, disorder. The town is basically dead. It's filled with taverns. People don't go to mass. People are cursing. They're drinking. You're blaspheming. In other words, a total disregard for God. Now, many of us would give in to discouragement and say, what's the purpose of going to this place that is dead? But he didn't do that. Quite the contrary. He would try to refurbish the church physically, but then he starts off by spending long hours in prayer. And with that prayer, he added to the prayer the fasting. Now with that, he got rid of the, the comfortable furniture in his rectory. And he slept on the floor. And he scourged himself. And the devil would come to visit him at night to insult him. It started off very slow. And then he started to visit some of the homes. Many of them were farmers. Then he'd ring the bell for people to come to church. And gradually they started to come to church. Then they came to confession. And then he would start to catechize them. Then he prayed even more. He'd boil a, a pot of potatoes and eat two or three potatoes at midday, and that was about it. And he would say, Lord, send me any suffering, but save my people. And the resistance was broke down he was able to close the, the bars and the taverns, even though the owners were very angry at him. And people started to come back to church. Then people came to confession. And more and more people would come to confession to the Curie of Ars. So much so 
that the end of his life or when he was already into years there in, in ours and he spent about 40 years there he was hearing from 13 to 17 hours of confessions every day put an average of about 15 you'd have long lines of people would be waiting sometimes days to be able to go to confession to this humble priest even a railroad, railroad station would be eventually built to get to ours. So the point I'm trying to make is the following. Is that in the wake of the French Revolution, the curie of ours was sent to a place that was basically dead. But it was resuscitated. Through his fervent prayer, through his fervent prayer, but also through his penance. You know, if he didn't have prayer and penance, it would be like that bird that I talked to you about, the bro the bird, the crow with the with a broken wing. The bird, the, bro, the crow with the broken wing was not going to soar and fly high unless the two wings were restored. Now, I like to apply this to us. Many of us Let's go from the Paris of the Curie of ours to your own family. So let's try to apply this story to ourselves. Let's go from the church to the domestic church, which is our family. How many of you have family me members? Maybe a spouse, maybe your children, maybe your grandchildren. That like in the life of the Curie of ours, they've walked away from God. They've walked away from the church. They've walked away from the practice of the sacraments. How many of us? Probably all of us. Probably all of us. We all have someone in mind that that we know is not where he should be related to God. We all have someone in our mind. Therefore, as the curie of ours was motivated to save his family, which was the church, his parish, so we should be motivated in our lives. We should be motivated in our lives to do all we can to be instrumental in bringing our loved ones back to God for the salvation of their souls. That's right. Like the Curie of ours, by, by a fervent prayer life and by a life dedicated to, to penance, we can be instrumental in bringing our loved ones back to God, back to church, back to confession, back to communion, and to be saved. And to be saved. As St. Paul says, we want to, St. Paul says, we want to fill up, St. Paul says, we want to fill up what is lacking in the passion of Christ.
The life of the cure of ours is very inspiring. Now I think, my friends, we have to recognize this. The value, the value in the eyes of God, the value in the eyes of God of one in one soul, your soul, the soul of your daughter, the soul of your loved one that is not walking with God is worth more than the whole created universe. If your son or daughter were the only person in the created universe, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ would have suffered his passion and death on the cross just <clears throat> for that one soul. It's good to remind us of the infinite value. The infinite value. We should remind ourselves of the infinite value, the infinite value of every soul created in the image and likeness of God. Our Lady said in Fatima a <coughs> hundred years ago, even more, she said, pray, pray and do penance. Pray and do penance. And she went on to say that many souls are lost. Many souls are lost because not enough people are offering up prayers and penance. St. Paul says to fill up what is lacking in the passion of Christ. Going back to the Curie of ours, why did he spend long hours in prayer? For the salvation of souls. Why did he deprive himself of sleep? For the salvation of souls. Why would he eat, why would he fast or eat or maybe two potatoes a day? For the salvation of souls. Why would he scourge himself? For the salvation of souls. Why would he spend long hours in the confessional? As many as 15 hours a day. Why? Why? For the conversion and salvation of souls. As Jesus says, what would it profit a man? What would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul in the process? What can a person give in exchange for his immortal soul. So, your prayers and your sacrifices and your penances and your mortifications, all of these, even though you might consider them very small, all of them, all of these, even though you might consider them very small, are great in the eyes of God if we offer these sacrifices with purity of intention and love. 
And it's not so much, it's so not so much the greatness of the action. Not so much the greatness of the action, but the purity of heart that is most pleasing to God. So you might stop today and in prayer and in reflection stop in prayer and reflection inviting the Holy Spirit to enlighten you and perhaps consulting you're consulting your spiritual director. What can I do today? What can I do today moved by the Holy Spirit to please God? What can I do? And I would suggest that you do it this way. Because we have to be we have to be motivated. For example, the curie of the curie of ours, why? Why did he undertake? Why did he undertake such enormous, huge sacrifices in his life? Why did he do that? And I'd have to say the primary reason why he did that was because of his great love. That's right. It was done out of love. Indeed, my friends, if we if we truly love God, and I think all of us are really trying to, to grow in our love for God, if we truly, we truly do love God. In our Perseverance family, I don't think there's any doubt that all of us are, are trying to grow in our love for God. If we truly do love God, then we should love what God loves. Now, what does God love? God is love. But also what God loves, my friends, of all creation, of everything in creation, everything in creation, what God loves more than anything else is the human person created in his image and likeness. And he loves and what he desires is the salvation, the salvation of our immortal soul. St. Thomas Aquinas the angelic doctor puts it this way, charity, charity which means supernatural love, can be defined as willing, as willing the good of the other. And what is the summum bonum? What is the greatest what is the greatest good the greatest good that we can desire for another is the salvation of his immortal soul. So my friends, going back to the story, the analogy I gave at the very beginning of our talk today. We can pick, we can compare ourselves to the to the blackbird, to the crow that I met when I was taking my walk. 
The blackbird, the crow, could not fly for the simple reason that one of his wings was broken. He couldn't fly, he couldn't soar into the atmosphere. We are called, my friends, to fly high, to soar to the heights, to reach the pinnacle, to reach the summit. We're called to fly high in the spiritual life. We have to utilize the two wings. The wings of prayer first and foremost, but then we have to utilize also the wing of penance. So in prayer, let's ask the Holy Spirit also through proper direction, what type of penance, fasting, mortification should I do for the honor and glory of God and for the salvation of immortal souls? May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.